welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. And today our subject matter will be osteoporosis. Um, definition defined pretty easy. It translates into porous bones. That means bones that are not solid, hard, pliable, flexible. They are full of holes. Uh, it's brought on by faulty dietary and lifestyle habits. And statistically, 50% of all women between the ages of 45 and 70 will suffer osteoporosis. Not too much statistical data on men. And men also suffer from this issue as well. We're going to address today in this show both male and female osteoporosis and the things that can be done, the testing that needs to be completed, those types of things. First of all, the symptoms that are associated with osteoporosis. If you see people, they're kind of stooped over, humped over, they've got a, a hump in their back, uh, they've got chronic backache issues oftentimes, um, spine starts to shrink, sometimes the limbs will start to shrink up and they'll notice that the hems in their pants or the hems in their skirts are all of a sudden the clothes are too long for them and primarily in the spinal we'll see a shrinking where someone will be six foot tall and they'll shrink down to five foot ten so big signs uh, easily broken bones uh, minor little falls minor little hitting twistings the bones will break very very easily there is testing procedures which uh, shoot a beam into the foot or the hip with the hip being most accurate that can te test for bone density, particularly outer layer bone density, but truly to test deep within the bones to know how healthy the bones are for osteoporosis. There's really actually no good testing procedures uh, on that short of dissection, which is not an alternative. Um, the root causes, and we discussed a little bit, it's faulty dietary and lifestyle habits, but the root causes inactivity, someone who doesn't move, who doesn't put any uh, stress on the bones and the muscles. So the bones just don't manufacture new bone cells. Uh, poor diet and nutritional, uh, nutritional deficiencies, particularly in childhood. If you've got a child that's a soda drinker, oh boy. Uh, if you've got a child that eats a lot of sugar, oh boy. During those um, developmental periods, it's really important that kids get adequate amounts of minerals, including calcium, magnesium, the trace minerals, and a oodles, a bunch of other things that help manufacture and make bone. But if the diet, too, then becomes, as we discussed down here, too um, acidic, so a lot of sugar, white flour, pasta, starches, McDonald's, Taco Bell, name it, all the junk food types of stuff, from a pH standpoint, when we are acidic, we pull calcium out of the bones to neutralize the pH. And when we do that, the bones kind of deteriorate and they crumble. And when you're in a developing phase, particularly in childhood, and those bones don't develop well in childhood, guess what's going to happen later on in life? They're estimating at least one quarter of the girls that come out of high school now have osteoporosis. One quarter. Pretty substantial figure for girls who are 19 and under. Um, Long-term use of certain drugs also contribute to osteoporosis. Anticonvulsants, pregnisone, a big one that's used for if you have inflammation or an allergic reaction. Long-term usage of pregnisone can absolutely stop all bone formation. And actually, not just temporarily necessary, there's necessarily, there are some research that supports it may, to some extent, over long-term stop adequate bone manufacturing. Blood thinners, because obviously you can't get nutrients into the bones uh, if you're thinning the blood. Um, methotrexate, which is a drug that's used for um, rheumatoid arthritis. Lithium, which is often used for or is used for bipolar. Uh, Lasix. Now, Lasix is, or those classifications of drugs, are diuretics. Uh, and when you're washing out your trace minerals and you're washing out your minerals with diuretics, Oh boy, how can you don't have the minerals available for the bones? And that's problematic. Uh, and when Lasix or certain uh, di diuretic high blood pressure medications can wash those out of you so you can't manufacture good bone. And acids, particularly like Tums. I see more physicians recommend Tums for calcium, and I want to scream because all your, your, your body requires stomach acids in order to utilize and absorb uh, calcium. And acids or acid redux 
block that ability of having adequate amounts of stomach acids for calcium absorption. So please, if there's any docs out there, don't recommend Tums. There's clinical data that says absolutely not. You'll end up giving your patients with the Tums as well high dosages of calcium carbonate that's going to settle in their joints, in their kidneys. So don't, no recommendation in that regard. And there's clinical data to back that up. Uh, chemotherapy. A uh, big thing for, uh, I have a lot of ladies, uh, customers of mine, that have undergone chemo for breast cancer. And chemo long-term wise, oftentimes we'll see 10 years later a lot of issues with bones or bone marrow issues. Um, thyroid. Huh. Thyroid excessive or lack of. In other words, a thyroid that's not in balance can lend itself to bone loss as well. Smoking, toxic metals. Remember, smoking depletes vitamin C. Toxic metals compete with other minerals. The body has to work real hard. Certain toxic metals can bind to calciums, magnesiums, and other minerals that block calcium absorption into the bone. Smoking is a big one primarily because chemicals as well as it blocks 25 to 50 milligrams of vitamin C, which is really important for bone um, making. And I'll explain that a little further on. Hormone deficiencies. Now, there are certain um, blood and saliva tests that doctors can give to test for hormone deficiencies, um, particularly estrogens, uh, might help if I spelled it right, estrogen, progesterones, testosterones, DHEA, growth hormone, and uh, calcitonin as well. These are all hormones that are necessary, three of which I misspelled, getting fast on the computer. Um, that literally, really, if you're lacking progesterone, it's very difficult to manufacture a new bone. And for the guys, when testosterone level drops up, the bones get brittle. So I recommend for most men and women to have some hormonal checking, progesterone, saliva, estrogen, and testosterone, and free testosterone can be done through the blood. Get those levels checked from about 50 onward. Uh, DHEA, saliva testing as well. You know, you don't think of hormones as being, um, and thyroid hormone as well, you don't think of those hormones as being something that would contribute to bone gaining or bone loss, but they do. And it's kind of important to know what your levels are and if they're in normal range, particularly if you're experiencing issues with weight gain, tiredness, fluctuations in moods, things that tend to go along with uh, different uh, hormone deficiencies. There's also uh, hormones that we know as well uh, cortisol and parathyroid. Now, parathyroid, huh, in order for your body to properly absorb calcium, the parathyroid has to function well. It regulates uh, calcium levels. And if you have a parathyroid malfunction, sometimes you'll end up with excessive calcium levels. And under those circumstances, then we increase magnesium, and we really have to watch the calcium levels and make sure it's a real good calcium, like calcium citrate or a bone calcium, uh, in order to get those levels down. Um, cortisol is a stress hormone. Now, stress hormones kind of act like battery acid to the vascular system and to the bones and to the immune system and to everything else. So stress, cortisol, or the inability to stabilize or regulate cortisol, saliva testing is necessary to detect that, can really affect bone uh, production and increase bone loss. Because when you get under stress, your body pH becomes very acidic, and once again, the body's going to have to pull out of the bones calcium to neutralize that pH, and your body carries a pH, and here's that high school chemistry that you thought you'd never hear again, but your body carries a pH of about 7.35, which is slightly alkalized, 7 being neutral, uh, you know, and obviously the higher you go, the more alkali you are, the lower you go, the more acidic you are. Um, lack of sun exposure. I know there's a lot of warnings uh, that we hear about uh, having to do with sun. When we're out in the sun, in particularly open sleeves, uh, in the key months here in our area, between April and October, um, we manufacture our own natural vitamin E, or excuse me, vitamin D through the skin. Uh, the skin is the best way to absorb and manufacture it. There are pill and supplement forms, but getting that 20 to 30 minutes a day of some type of sun. Now, when you wear sunscreen, there ain't no vitamin D production. So, unless you're extremely sun sensitive, 20 minutes a day of sun is necessary for a lot of things, but for vitamin D production, 
it's paramount. Now, between the months of October and April in our latitude and longitude locations, and there's a little science there for you too, your little geography, sorry about that, but where we're located, those six months, we don't tend to get the direct type of sun rays that really enable us to manufacture much vitamin D on the skin. So under those circumstances, where we're located may require some supplementation. Um, eating disorders. Now, we talked about uh, acid pH and pH balance. People who have anorexia or who vomit all the time or diet, severe dieting, those kinds of things, once again, it really affects the body's pH uh, levels. When you affect the pH levels, once again, you pull calcium out of the bones to neutralize that pH, and the bones get more and more and more porous as you're trying to pull out that calcium. Prolonged stress, we talked about the cortisol levels. Once again, increase the acidity and the pH. Now, there is some heredity to all of this. Um, uh, one side of my family is very, very fine-boned. So here I am, fine-boned. The German side is real strong and hearty. The other side is fine-boned, and I have fine bones. So my heredity says that if I'm not careful with keeping my strength training, my bones, good health as far as my supplementation and diet, I would probably be more prone to having osteoporosis. So that does play a part as well. Now, when we're talking about diet, boy, all kinds of typographicals here. I apologize for that. Um, eating foods high in calcium and, and <laughs> some interesting information that I found. It might explain why so many of the Oriental populations don't te tend to have these issues and all the milk-drinking countries have a much higher rate of osteoporosis. Believe it or not, milk only has about a 25% absorption level on its calcium and it has no magnesium for that calcium to absorb. So milk is a great form of protein, I think, but not for calcium levels. And, and so I hear all these TV commercials and research, and it's like, you know, actually what you guys are saying is truly not the truth. So the vegetables that are really high in calcium, sea vegetables primarily, um, wakame, and most of us are going to go, unless we're from Japan or, or China or from the Orient, are going to say, what's wakame? It's a sea vegetable. Um, leafy vegetables, fermented soy, nuts, molasses, salmon, oysters, sardines with the bones in them. Don't try to debone them. Those bones are really rich in bone calcium sources, believe it or not. Broccoli and unsweetened cultured yogurt. Now, there is some exception as far as when you culture milk products, it makes the calcium much more absorbable for the body. Um, Green vegetables also, high in vitamin K. Vitamin K is necessary to utilize uh, calcium and, and some other things we'll go into a little later on. So it's very, very important. Those green leafy, um, other than spinach, the green leafy vegetables have high amounts of calcium, magnesium, and trace minerals. Provided that they're organic, you'll get more trace minerals in them and more calcium. So keep in mind, most standard grocery store greens aren't going to be very mineral rich because the soils just, uh, the crops just aren't rotated. Uh, the standards today are much, much different than they were 100 years ago. We mentioned earlier avoiding sugar, refined grains, soda pop, excessive red meat, salt, caffeine, alcohol. These are all uh, acidic producing items uh, that we can ingest and eat, in which, once again, our body has to pull calcium to maintain that pH of 7.35. If you don't maintain that pH, you die. So the body's going to pull whatever it can to neutralize the pH when you down that soda pop. So with time, boy, it's going to leach and leach calcium. And then if you don't have proper diet or supplementation on that calcium, the bones will crumble. And, the, and I'm seeing people's bones crumble in the 40s. This is no longer grandma's 80-some years old. She's hunched over. Yeah, we got some of that. But I'm seeing bones crumble at 40 which is very disheartening because the soda pop generation that we've got now, I don't know what's going to happen when they're in their 30s and 40s, um, but we're going to see, and I already have some women that are coming in their 20s that are starting with a little hump in their back. So being aware of this. So eating alkali-producing foods. You can go online and you can punch in alkali diet. Most of your uh, fruits and vegetables, other than tomatoes and oranges, most of your um, fruits and vegetables are alkali-producing. Your meats, your sugars, your starchy carbs are pretty acidic. It's usually recommended that you get 80% of your diet from alkali-producing foods and about 
uh, 20% of acidic producing, which is your proteins and, and those types of things. The most acidic thing you can have is sugar and stress and anger and all that within yourself. You got to got to really focus on trying to get that body the body more alkali by nature. Exercise, particularly weight bearing exercise, lots of data on that. I, I particularly with seniors, if we can get weight bearing, that means you're stressing the bones. You're saying, okay, bones, you got to be stronger. Let's get some weight bearing in here to to push you to want to stimulate bone formation. So weight bearing exercises are really helpful at any age for stimulation of of bone. Now, when we address supplementation, and I've got a couple of pages here that address supplementation, if we had the most perfect world of foods, this wouldn't be necessary. But we don't have the most perfect world of foods anymore because the nature of our farming. So when people look at me and say, hey, there's a lot of pills here, uh, or when we've got one physician, Dr. Lindbergh, who gives, has a little list he gives his clients who have osteoporosis that have four or five things on there. And like, God, I'm taking all these pills. It's because the diet just doesn't contain it. And there are some physicians that recommend it, like Dr. Lindbergh, that basically recognize that it's nutritional issues. And yeah, he can throw some of the bonivas and things like that at him, but without the nutrition, yeah, we're not going to make new bone. So let's look at the things that can contribute and help with bone in supplementation forms because our food is just not so good. We've got calcium in a bone or a citrate form, which uh, enables, uh, it's the building blocks for, for the bones in combination with magnesium. If you don't have magnesium, calcium ain't going to absorb. And magnesium citrates are the best. I have a lot of physicians that swear by oxide, but I, I try to let them know that plant sources of minerals are always more, are a little bit more, uh, actually a lot better absorbed than most of the manufactured oxide forms. Vitamin D3, and I see more doctors, not just one or two, but quite a few of them now recommending supplementation from, with D, um, D3 particularly because it's a food um, uh, fish source generally as a rule. Uh, 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day. And what it does is it enables the body to pick up and utilize calcium in the digestive tract and prevent urinary loss of calcium. Vitamin D is a lot of other things, as, as Ralph has mentioned uh, in his uh, excerpts that he's given, as far as cancer, immune, I mean, the, the, it's endless. The list is endless. But from a calcium absorption, D is very, very important. Vitamin K. It attracts calcium into the bone matrix, which is an, um, there's a certain type of protein that enables calcium to be utilized, and K activates that. The only problem with K is if you're on a blood thinner, you know, K tends to enable the blood to be able to clot a little bit easier, and if you're on a blood thinner, you can't use vitamin K. Iproflavone, 600 milligrams with food has been shown to help bone, uh, not stimulation, but adhere a little bit better, the, the uh, calcium that you do absorb, to adhere a little bit better to the bone. Essential fatty acids, and you're thinking, fats? How could fats help me with calcium absorption? Uh, they enable the body. They reduce inflammatory aspects. They just seem to be able to, in reduction of inflammation, enable calcium to be better utilized by the body. Strontium, strontium, not radioactive, but strontium and minerals, strontium citrate in particular, and there are carbonates, uh, improve density, and there's clinical data on strontiums and their absorption or aid, ability to aid in the absorption of your calcium. Progesterone, research, 30 years worth of research um, by various physicians, including the Mayo Clinic, Dr. John Lee, particularly for menopausal women that help aid in the absorption of calcium and or stimulate the ability of bone making calciums. Boron, I've got an endless list here. Vitamin C, needed for the collagen formation for bone. You think of bone as just being minerals, but there's sticking properties to it. So the collagen is really, really important for the bone. We've got silicon, zinc, copper, good multiple high-end Bs. Um, we try to keep the homocysteine inflammatory factors down. The Bs help reduce those homocysteine factors. We talked about stomach acids and taking antacids. If you neutralize your stomach acids, you're not going to absorb calcium at all. 
when we're talking about drug therapy, most drug therapy only increased or lessened the chances of bone fractures over a lifetime by about 2%. So you hear them say, oh, it increases bone density uh, 40%. And I'm thinking, okay, the, with those inaccurate tests, all they do is make the outside of the bone a little bit harder. And when you make the outside of the bone harder, that doesn't make more pliable, flexible, thicker bone. The tests truly are not really very accurate uh, in figuring things out. I've listed uh, some testing on here, if you'd like to write these down from the show, that can, uh, I think physicians can run to see if maybe there are other contributing factors that might uh, substantiate why a person's all of a sudden having bone loss, or especially if they're in their 40s or menopausal time, various tests that they can perform. The primary ones uh, are obviously some of the hormone testings, but vitamin and mineral analysis, digestive functioning. Do we have a lot of candida and yeast issues going on that make a body very, very acidic? These can all, you can run stool samples to get that figured out. And then figuring out allergies, once again, we discussed inflammatory actions. If you're very, very inflamed, then your body's not going to utilize calcium. Since this lecture was so long, we're going to have to forego our, ex our exercise portion of the show. We're going to be moving on to our research portion of our show. Thank you. portion of our show and with us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph. And thank you for the intro. Well, the first one comes out this tug of war with the media on regards to St. John's Ward. Well, Cochrane University, or so they say Cochrane researchers finally put it to sleep. They looked at 29 trials at 5,489 patients. What they discovered was this, and I'll just read the quote. Overall, we found that St. John's wort extracts tested in trials were superior to placebos and as effective as standard antidepressants with fewer side effects, said the lead researcher Klaus Lind of the Center for Complementary Medicine in Munich, Germany. They reviewed 29 separate trials. They also said two. Not only were the plant extracts considered to be equally effective, but fewer patients dropped out of the trials due to the adverse effects and they used a Hamilton rating scale for depression in order to determine severity. This was a well done study. I'm curious about this because the media tends to have no problem reporting the negatives on St. John's wort from obscure trials, but this was well done and I haven't heard anything in the news yet. Now let's go on to vitamin D. Vitamin D is a rising star. Now here we go right now, right off the bat for skin issues, especially atopic dermatitis. They gave 4,000 IUs of oral vitamin D for 21 days. And this was done from the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. Then they biopsied it after that 21 days and they found that the oral vitamin D seemed to correct those skin conditions. That's just number one. Number two, vitamin D deficiency common in patients with IBD and chronic liver disease. Amazingly, they found that patients when given vitamin D had a mass reduction in their symptoms. This was presented at the 73rd Annual Scientific Meeting of American College of Gastroenterology. And they also discovered this, in people with liver disease, especially chronic liver conditions, that 92.4% of those people with chronic liver conditions were deficient in vitamin D. One third of those people severely deficient. That means hospitaliz hospitalization type deficient. And they also found those with cirrhotics, even a greater percentage. I don't know how close to 100 you possibly can get. And then came the big one. Vitamin D, a key player in the overall health of several body organs, find out the UC of Riverside. They discovered that vitamin D is responsible for the health of 36 separate organs, and they're changing the recommendations. Now what they're saying is basically not the measly 200 IUs that the government is recommending for people for so long. They are saying now the daily use should be 2,000 IUs. 
For all those people you're doing your multivitamins, you're still not quite up there, but guess what? You're way ahead of the game with those people not doing anything at all. And this was done, again, by UC Riverside, and the researcher there was Anthony Norman, and it's also printed in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition on top of that. And they said that the maximum safe dose of vitamin D they found was 10,000 IUs. And they also said, too, there needs to be a sea of change by various governmental agencies in terms of its advice to present citizens, especially in regards to all these nutrients. And now, back to flu vaccines. I'm not pro or con in regards to flu vaccines, but they discovered this printed in the Archive of Pediatrics and Adolescent Medicine, one of the Journal of American Medical Association's own documents. They found out it did virtually nothing in reducing hospitalizations or illness in children. In fact, they also came to the strong point saying that only 11% of the vaccines issued even bothered to come close to the strains that matched those that were circulating, making people ill, at least between the years of 2003 and 2004. And when you come to think about it, what incentive do these people that determine these vaccines have to do a good, do a good job anyways? Most of the public buys, lines up, and takes exactly what they recommend, whether it works or not. They said, too, as of June 2006, U.S. health officials recommend annual vaccines for all children ages 6 to 59 months, quote, based upon an inherent assumption of expanded vaccination, vaccination recommendations is that the vaccine is efficacious in preventing clinical influenza disease, the authors write, and it is not. Then, after that, a lot of us think about low brain sugar as far as people saying, hey, my sugar's are low, I can't think straight. They discovered that the brain could work off a lactate, a lactic acid. In fact, when you, when you exercise, your brain uses lactic acid as fuel. It's a way of clearing the lactic acid out of the blood. And this was published in the Netherlands, this was done in the Netherlands, October 2008, in the FASEB journal. Very interesting. And basically, that brain also can use something else as fuel, lactic acid, a lactate. It's going to change the whole structure of how people view their energy. Watch how it comes. After that, real fast, Journal of American Medical Association found out and analyzed newspapers. They looked at most about, I'd say, 175 newspapers. They found out that conflicts of interest and funding sources were not reported in 42% of the articles placed. They also discovered that 88% of those editors of those magazines said that generally that they do make their people list their conflicts of interest or doctors if they're getting funding from research from conflicting sources. In reality, they discovered that most of them did not. Of these articles, again, that they researched, 45% failed to recite any company funding whatsoever. It's a newspaper, people. What incentive do they have to color the facts? Makes you wonder. Sometimes these politicians may be a little correct in regards to the bias. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate the information. Once again, more on vitamin D and the flu vaccine. We hope that this encourages you to do your further research and gives you a little additional information to make good decisions. Have a great day. Thanks.